Hello, everybody, and welcome to Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 49. So we're going to go with Jeremy for the BIPCOT no-gov license. <laughs> yes, as always, this Seeds of Liberty podcast is covered by the BIPCOT no-government license. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. So today we have Sterling Lujan coming in from Texas. He's a volunteerist, anarchist, journalist, and a counselor in training. He runs psychologicanarchist.com and the uh, Psychologic Anarchist Facebook page. Uh, and, and we'll be discussing his ideas on the relationship between anarchy and psychology, uh, and especially um, starting with his uh, article, Lay Siege to the Therapeutic State. Uh, so uh, Sterling, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, Danilo. You guys are all awesome. Love your show. Uh, we, well, I love your, your Bitcoin articles and all, all the stuff you put out, man. You know, man, I appreciate uh, it. I appreciate you answering my Bitcoin question earlier. Oh, yeah. No problem. <laughs> That's uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Maybe we can even jump into that a little later. We'll see if time uh, permits. Hopefully, all maybe. Right, yeah, I've known you for like two years and I've never spoken to you, so it's nice to finally speak. <laughs> we work so closely on, on your page and, uh, you know, when you transition from Turncoat to uh, to this one and, and you've been growing it like really well, very nicely. Uh, I see you've been putting a lot of effort into it, which is, uh, you know, what happens when you work, <laughs> when you put effort, you grow and you get results, right? So right on. You, you didn't ask, you didn't ask the government for favors. <laughs> uh, no, this, it's a uh, pure, pure, spon- right, pure spontaneous order. <laughs> <laughs> see that awesome <laughs> so yeah so so go into a little bit about your uh, your background with the psychology and anarchy and uh, and uh, you know what's what's the link that you see between the two sure i just uh cover it real briefly uh when i became an anarchist one of the first person one of the first people that i came into contact with uh, a lot of you guys may be able to resonate with this was uh stefan molyneux right so i have to credit stefan i'm not i as a disclaimer, I'm not a real big fan of his uh, to this day because he's uh, had a few what I call ideological shifts. So mm-hmm. I can't agree totally with his position, but I do credit him with being one of the first uh, libertarian slash anarchist thinkers to really bring uh, psychological thinking into the fray, especially the whole notion of peaceful parenting. I think it's fair to, to give him some credit for that. Uh, Rothbard, some of these other guys might have talked briefly about it, but not to the extent as he did. So. Uh, anyway, I, I, as I shifted over to an anarchist, I started watching his videos, uh, be, sort of became accustomed to his uh, psychological perspective. I was already in school at that time getting my bachelor's degree in psychology. Uh, after I received my degree, I, of course, I continued reading, continued studying. You know, I stayed on the beaten path of anarchism. And just over the last, uh, just over the last year, I uh, finally decided it's, this is after a two-year hiatus. I decided to start getting my master's degree in psychology, and at some point, I, I started. I started to have some thinking, uh, some thoughts that Molyneux maybe wasn't. Uh, you know, you, I, I want to say that he was just psychologizing rather than bringing a clinical experience and some more of the research-based aspects. Uh, in into the fray, you know, notwithstanding all the people that he's uh, interviewed. Well, his, uh, his main thing is philosophy, right? You know? Correct, correct, correct. So, yeah, he kind of touches on a little bit of everything. Anyway, so some of my initial ideas were, and this is where how the psychologic anarchist uh, sort of came into existence. I started thinking there has been no one that has really synthesized and integrated uh, aspects of anarchism and uh psychotherapy and clinical counseling. So it's a very specific aspect of it. And uh, this is different because it, re- it re- literally requires me to create a, a theory and a set of principles to apply in the counseling scenario, right? So in the counselor's room, I would, I would need to work with people directly and I would need to develop my theory based on sort of based on those ideas. And, and just to bear in mind, this is still some history. This isn't even getting into the, uh, the idea of the problems with psychiatry. But uh, th- this is sort of how I see the way. I, I love the idea of counseling and helping, to, uh, helping people in what Freud called talk therapy, right? I, I really do believe one of the best ways to actually help people is to have, uh, you know, sit down and have discussions and be able to empathize and connect with people, right? 
and that's that's not something that modern uh, psychiatry sort of uh, sort of does at all. They have this me mechanistic and reductionistic model of human behavior, and that's just to say that everything that hap that that we do behaviorally that is seen as a negative or distressful is uh, it, it's it's bad and it's faulty, and it's based on either bad wiring, uh, genetics, or a chemical imbalance in the brain, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's sort of where where I really came into play with this idea of psychological anarchist. I want to really uh, adopt anarchist principles to psychotherapy and and help people from that perspective, because I believe that the way that we've learned to sort of think uh, to uh, break down cognitive dense is uh, really, really beneficial and really helpful for getting people. Uh, not only to not and not just to understand our position, but for for them to live their life uh, uh, with less distress, less anxiety, more happiness. Because I think breaking down those uh, not only the illogical thoughts, but also being able to actually connect with other people and to understand them from a peaceful and voluntary uh, position is uh, is is a very powerful uh, motive for living and being more happy. Right? It's uh, it, to me, it's the crux of passion. So that, that's that's kind of what I tried what, what I've been trying to do with the synthesis did. And I'm right now I'm just calling it neuro liberty uh, therapy. So me, and that's go ahead to, to me. It, uh, what you're touching on seems to me like, uh, you know, what I did in myself is I, I got I eliminated the fear of, uh, you know, of a stateless society out of my body. You know, it doesn't scare me anymore. Uh, you know, not not really that it scared me at the beginning of when I started reading into this stuff or anything like that. But the you know, after I read this stuff, the that fear did set in. It's like, well, how would the roads really be built? You know, <laughs> it's like, right. So, you know, you, you got to conquer those fears and get those those con contradictions out of your head. And uh, I think uh, teaching people how to do that is very key. And and approaching this from a psych a psycho logical aspect is amazing i really think this is cool right yeah to me it's the it's it, it's helped me in so many different ways uh, as far as with my relationships you know there's some relationships that are obviously difficult when you're, it, it, but that's if you approach it from the standpoint of everybody else is wrong and i've got to berate them every step of the way and that's an understandable sentiment because that's uh that's what we feel that we need to do in order to push uh, so, sort of uh, I guess push over to the other side to get everybody involved in uh, in anarchism. I just don't think that we're we're sort of doing it in the in the appropriate way. I don't think we're really trying to empathize and connect with people on a visceral and a in a, in a base level. And, and that's that's not that, that's I'm generalizing a little bit. And it's 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 tough. I'm also I'm also getting off off topic a bit. But that that is, that is essentially the idea of uh, of neural liberty therapy. I haven't brought all the principles together, and I haven't really uh, because I haven't had a chance to actually get down, sit down with people, and start bringing it into uh, uh, into complete fruition. So it's it's just uh, I can envision it. It's theoretical, uh, and there's of course some problems that I'm going to have to contend with. Right? Uh, there's an ethical consideration. You're not supposed to get into the counselor's uh, room and tell other people how they should live their lives or uh, even provide them with with my principles, uh, but it, it, here I have an argument to the to psychologists and uh, counselors when it comes to that. Uh, obviously, uh, feminism is actually a theoretical position that people use uh, that counselors use right now. And if anything is trying to promote your agenda and push your social justice warrior material onto other people uh, in the counseling scenario, uh, feminist uh, theory would do that. So I think that if uh, feminists can have a psychological or psychotherapeutic uh, theory, then anarchists should be able to have the same thing. So that's what doesn't exist yet. What I'm, uh, you know, what I'm trying to, uh, to Basically, build and create. you know, if they're going to propagandize, why is it bad for us to as well? And, you know, that was a, that was why I shifted my attitude on a lot of things a while back because everyone wants to get into this debate. You're not doing anarchy, right? And I'm like, this is pointless. The only way to do anarchy right is someone who doesn't want a leader or a, not a leader, but a ruler. And, you know, that's it. All this other stuff is we're wasting time, energy and resources debating on things that don't matter. You know, right. You know, what I love about what you do is that, uh, you know, how everybody 
comes to anarchy and volunteerism from a different perspective, right? Some people are rappers, some people are authors, some people, you know, have blogs, you know, so, so, um, you know, some people are professors or, you know, in college or history professors, let's say, you know, and uh, you come at it from the psychological perspective and, uh, you know, you bring it into the, the counseling room, you know, if, with the, with like the patient uh, or the client, you know, um, uh, relationship. And, uh, and like you said, you know, I, I don't look at it as like trying to indoctrinate them, but just, you know, just, um, I guess the way you talk and, you know, the, the way that you, yeah, the way that you communicate with the person, I think they can pick up on on the ideas of non-aggression, property rights, self-ownership, you know, not by telling them <laughs> about them, but just by you describing things from your perspective. I think that that's how people would pick up on it. Right. And then, of course, there's that. It, it's also uh, just the relationships that the counselors uh, in inevitably have to uh, develop with their clients. It's supposed to be based on uh, communication, uh, empathy, active listening. And if one thing that anarchists, in my, in my perspective, actually want, it's the ability to connect with other people. We know that statism essentially starts at home. Uh, a lot of us ha have had really shitty childhoods in a lot of ways. A lot of people, of course, don't want to admit that uh, through either being spanked or, or uh, hurt. Or uh, there, there was this book, uh, by Alice Miller called For Your Own Good. And she talked about how one of the things that we we're originally taught in childhood by our parents is how not to feel, right? So if you, if you, if you acted out as a, as a child, how many times have you been uh, told to shut up? Uh, don't feel that way. You're not allowed to be angry at me. So, so we understand that in, in childhood that our, relation, our, our ability to relate with other people was essentially broken. So that's why, in my perspective, the counseling environment in, in regards to helping people heal with the philosophy of anarchism, with the philosophy of being able to relate with compassion to one another, is so supremely important, right? That is, uh, that is really the crux of it. And, and I guess where we, how we move on from there, one of the things that pisses me off about modern uh, psychiatry and psychology is that they've moved away from this interpersonal aspect. They've moved away from this ability, uh, th this idea that we should connect with each other. And then the problems that we have aren't, uh, they're not diseases. They're not illnesses. Our brains aren't broken. Uh, we had shitty childhood, shitty environments Our the nurture levels that we had as children were horrible as we talked about. So, uh, yeah, I mean, not treating people as, as robots and trying to evade this idea that our environments and our relationships have anything to do with our, our development is just a sad, uh, sort of a sad part of modern psychiatry, uh, industrial psychology is what it's been called. So that's what I'm, what I'm hoping to do in these in the professional spheres is, get, is sort of get counselors, uh, other professionals involved in, uh, in changing the paradigm, you know, fomenting this paradigm shift in counseling. And, and, and here's the, there's another point to that. There are the, like regular counselors, mental clinical health counselors and social workers. They do tend to, to behave in regards and counsel in regards to the uh, interpersonal aspects, the relational aspects. Whereas the big, the big problem recently promoting the medical model has been uh, industrial psychiatry, right? They're wanting to pass out, all these um, uh, pharmaceutical cocktails in order to try to heal people. And that stuff's been complete. Most of those uh, compounds are horrible for you, especially in the long term. So that's what we're, you know, what we all got to try to get away from and just completely abolish, unmake psychiatry, as I call it. Oh. Yeah. I, uh, well, I, 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 I can agree with that because uh, we, we talked a little bit before the before we started the show. Um, I mean, I I have a an intimate relationship with with this issue. Um, I I don't have the uh, you know professional background or the or the study you know the the research background that you have in this. But I you know when I was younger, I was one of those kids that was diagnosed of having all sorts of problems, and I became a guinea pig. Um, you know, and I, I went through uh, a few year period in my, I guess, mid teen, yeah, 16 to 19, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, where I was on like a litany of different drugs. Um, and it was just literally just throwing whatever they could at me just just to see what would work. You know, I was it was just I would they just I mean, from 
Prozac, which I think it was in there because that was that was an '80s drug, right, or '90s or early '90s when that first officially. Right. Whenever that was, was. right. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was one of the original test, test. Uh, I was one of the like one of the first out thousand. I, or couple I thousand remember people taking, on that. taking um, Ritalin, the first OG Ritalin. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, I was, I was on tranq. You know, they put me on tranquilizers. I mean, lithium, like all this different stuff, and it was instead of trying to talk to me and get me to figure out what was you know i mean they did that too but it was just this this was their quick fix and this is how a lot of a lot of the doctors were trained you know just it's literally what it is i mean the what is it the uh, the dsm the uh, is that what the the, the psychiatry book the cut they how, how often do they re- revise that every couple of years or is it every year or Right. Um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, I forget the exact time. It's every several years though. Yeah. Every, every like three, three or five, three to five, seven. Yeah. Whatever. And it, every year, you know, every, every new revision, there's just all these new diseases that just came up and it, it always bugged me because I, it just didn't make sense. Like where, like where, where are they coming up with all these things? Are, are they just, are they literally just making stuff up? I mean, that's what I thought for the longest time. And then when I started looking into it, and then when I got off all the drugs and started realizing what kind of effects they have, man, I started to think, well, wait a minute, maybe they really are just making this stuff up. Um, and, you know, it's, there's, there's a, an entire generation of mostly, um, you know, young boys that were subjected to this because, you know, we were told that, you know, our being boys was all of a sudden a bad thing, you know, right. ADHD and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And, you know, this, this explosion of, Oh yeah, well, you know, they, they shouldn't be acting like this. What do you mean? We shouldn't be acting like this. We're stuck in, we're, we're, we're for the most part, most of us were stuck in these institutions of quote unquote learning where you're forced to sit at a desk for, you know, however many hours a day. I mean, yes, you're allowed to get up and walk around occasionally, but whatever. But like you're stuck in these rooms and you're forced like boys, especially just want to run. They want to do things. They want to build things. They want to climb like you, you know, putting anybody in that scenario is just it's detrimental to them. And 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 the and, and instead of recognizing that um, it's well, no, well, we can fix this. Let's just give them drugs and we'll make them all zombies. And then that way we continue right. with business. Well, that's, as usual. That, that, that's it takes less responsibility off the parents' shoulders, right? The parents are like, Oh, this is the easy way out. This fixes my problem. I don't have to put any effort into this. Just make sure little Timmy chokes down his pill. Yeah, but right. I don't, well, I was just going to say, I don't think it's always the it's always the parents, though. I mean, I honestly I mean, I, I'm, I'm not absolving my parents of, of some of the of a lot of the mistakes they did make with me. I'm not, you know, but in me this either. issue, I really think they got talked into it, you know, and I've seen it happen well, since then. They were persuaded, but... Well, right, yeah, but right. because, again, you, you know, just like anything else, just like the state in general, people are brought, you know, like we, you were saying before, how statism starts at home. People are conditioned to think that the experts have the answers. You can't possibly know because you're not an expert. So if the expert says this, well, then that must be the case. So m- many people just have that go along to get along mentality and they don't they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to hurt. I don't think a lot of parents want to hurt their children. I mean, I'm sure there are ones that there, there are sociopaths that have kids that don't really care, I'm sure. Um, but I think on the whole, a lot of parents just wanted to do what's best for them and, and they were too afraid to speak up. Right. You know? Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. And I, I actually I identify with what you're saying, because when I was young, I was also diagnosed with ADD. I wasn't put on a cocktail uh, feels like you were for your <clears throat> quote unquote condition, but yep. I was given, uh, you know, methylphenidate, which is the active compound in, uh, in Ridland, which is, it's just a, basically a meth mixture. It's quasi, I mean, it, pretty close chemically to methamphetamine, not exactly the same it's slower release. Uh, and it's, you know, o- over a longer time span, but here's the thing with, uh, with psychiatry from square this is kind of a little bit of the history of how this all went down okay originally you know freud obviously started uh with uh psychotherapy and his his ideas uh were generated because of this uh you know what during the time what they called hysteria these these women would be in these hysteric uh moments and he he was one of the first people to uh characterize uh, you know, Freud was fond of using a lot of me- metaphors, so he initially mm-hmm. characterized these uh, problems as neurosis or uh, pathologies. And so 
from that moment, this uh, this idea that that uh, our problems of everyday living, or uh, I like to call it psychic, has uh, perpetuated itself uh, on, on through the, on through the times. And then I, or around the same time as Freud, uh, there was an individual by the name of, uh, Emil Kraepelin. And he was one of the, uh, the progenitors of what we now call the DSM. This guy, uh, initially called, uh, for instance, schizophrenia, dementia praecox, right? And, uh, what he was really known for is actually wanting to call these problems uh, brain problems or actual neurological conditions, even though um, what we were seeing is just uh, people's behavior, people's reaction to their environments, reaction to their settings, reactions to authoritarianism, very common things. And then uh, as this uh, as this stuff continued to snowball, uh, you know, the DSM was was eventually created. And then uh where, this is the important part of history, though. In the 1980s, uh, the DSM-3 came out, and before the DSM-3 came out, there were there was all kind that they they initially had all all kinds of different uh, causes, or there were ideas of causes behind these uh, mental disorders. But this is where it really changed to where it was uh, uh, it was a disease process. It was uh, DSM wise, and it, 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 that's really the best way to go about treating this issue. But during that time period. Uh, you know, from the 60s up to the 80s, psychiatry was under a lot of pressure from different movements. Um, you know, uh, Lang, uh, a little bit before that, the psychiatrist Lang, he was really speaking out against psychiatry. He was a psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Thomas Saws, after the name of my, I, I've mirrored a lot of my work off of his, uh, and it's very powerful. Was Dr. Stuff Thomas Saws, right? He was Saws. A, a, a Jewish uh, psychiatrist uh, and a libertarian. And he, you know, he was known for writing the book in the 70s, The Myth of Mental Illness. But uh, it was uh, these guys, there were, um, there were movements, especially from um, uh, the homosexual classes, because, you know, homosexuality was in the DSM early mm -hmm. on. So yeah. psych psychiatry <laughs> was initially being called a big, huge fraud and a scam. And, you know, it, it's got to be, because if you look at it in retrospect, how crazy it is, uh, it, people calling these uh, mental disorders in the DSM uh, diseases – uh, well, was homosexuality a disease? No, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that anybody in their right mind is going to consider that, uh, you know, a positive fact. And then if we go a little bit further back, um, uh, you know, in the early 18, no, in the in the later 1800s, I believe there's an individual by the name of Samuel Cartwright, and he came up with this disease called a, a drapetomania. And what this uh, mental illness or disease was, it was uh, uh, it caused slaves to flee captivity. Right, African American slaves to flee captivity, <laughs> and his cure, his uh, alleged cure for this was uh, a sound beating for the slaves, and this would uh, help try to alleviate their so-called mental illness. So <laughs> this is kind of the the really rough and brutish history uh, of uh, you know clinical psychiatry. Of course, Cartwright was way before you know all you know everything else came along here. But I mean, we can look at the similar cases today. We have. Things like uh, obviously ADD, ADHD uh, in the DSM, conduct disorder in the DSM. Um, I don't think that anybody uh, who's really honest would consider that uh, depression or bipolar disorder are actual diseases. And uh, of course, we can segue here, and I can really we can talk start talking a little bit about the science behind this stuff if you guys want mm -hmm. to. So, sure. so, so sort of the main theories. Uh, there's three main theories. The one that I'm most familiar with and the one that's most popular, of course, is the chemical imbalance theory. You know, psychiatry uh, since the 60s and the 70s into the 80s ha have been really uh, perpetuating this idea that mental illness is caused by chemical imbalance, depression, uh, the, the, uh, the less serotonin that you have, the more likely you are to be depressed, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. the higher levels of dopamine that you have, the more likely you are to be psychotic. But but here's the thing. Uh, I'll use depression as an example uh, for the sake of time. We can talk about schizophrenia some too. But with uh, okay with depression, uh, these this idea that the low serotonin levels uh, causes depression has not been fleshed out with the research. And there's a few reasons why that is. First of all, uh, you can ask anybody who goes to see a psychiatrist. You can't walk into a psychiatrist's office say, uh, "Doc, I, yeah, I'm you know I." I can't move. I lay in my bed all day. I'm feeling down and depressed. I don't want to talk to anybody. Uh, you can't go in there and tell them that. And they're going to, they're going to say, okay, uh, let me give you this blood test. Why don't you piss in this cup? And I'm going to tell you if your, your <laughs> serotonin levels are, are, are out of whack. 
No, that, yeah. that's that's not the case at all. They, they they do not have the tools to do that. There is no uh, diagnostic objective measure uh, to say that serotonin uh, is actually imbalanced in the brain. At least nothing that a psychiatrist is going to be able to use in an office in a sit in a clinical situation like that. Right. The only way that they've tried, this is how they've tried to um, sort of manufacture proof that this, that mental illness, especially depression actually exists. Uh, they ha- they've been, they've done a metabolite test on uh, the serotonin metabolites, which is called five H I A A. Right. And uh, what it does, it collects in our cerebral spinal fluid and they've actually, um, They've done some studies where they've injected uh, depressed groups and control groups uh, and, and pulled out some of that uh, 5-HIA, and they tried to make uh, comparisons in the research study to see if the uh, group that should be depressed was depressed or the control group, who was usually clinically healthy populations, were not depressed. And uh, all, most of all of the studies came out uh, inconclusive or the, the, the um, statistically significant factors were not uh, – uh, they were uh, confounded by other variables, but w- one of the main things that, that we've seen is that it didn't it, it it didn't pan out. And obviously, if it didn't pan out, then there's no way that psychiatrists can actually test a mental illness or you know for depression, the mental illness in psychiatric settings. Then they're then they're standing on really shaky ground as far as uh, believing it. What they call the biogenic amine theory of depression, which is the the serotonin issues so, so it's just uh, pseudoscience basically oh man a- a- absolutely and it's all happened because of this um this is another conversation but it's all happened because of this corruption between the state uh between psychiatry and between a uh, uh, big pharma and i don't mean to conspiratorialize this stuff it's just the nature of what happens in these power structures right all these guys mm-hmm. they, they get together scratch each other's back there's a lot of money to be made in selling uh, pills to people especially with these long-term uh, you know, in prognostic goals. So, uh, as you see, it's a it's a really big it's, uh, it's is, a big cluster. Is still up. killing and, it right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a it, it's a huge clusterfuck. And uh, when you get into looking at what these these drugs actually do, uh, there's some evidence that the the antidepressant class of chemicals actually causes uh, suicidal ideations, right? Causes people to become suicidal, which is the, uh, the antithesis of what psychiatry is claiming to do by feeding people these, these pills. And there's uh, uh, pharmacological, psychopharmacological reasons why that's happening. And the main thing is, is um, when people take these drugs, uh, the brain has compensatory effects uh, that actually creates extra receptors in that particular brain, those particular brain regions, uh, and, and it and basically cascades and can actually cause, you know, the, the quote unquote chemical imbalance that they were supposed to have uh, in the first place or um, cause other problems that could potentially be neurological where some of these these uh, thoughts and these ideas may may stem from. So mm-hmm. uh, if you want uh, to if you think you have depression and you go to the psychiatrist's office, if you didn't have depression before, you probably will have depression uh, as a result <laughs> of uh, toxic- toxicity right. from from drugs and compounds. So and and the the case is even worse, and it's even clearer with the uh, the antipsychotic medications. Uh, the 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 clinical trials and reports are very clear that in the long term, uh, these chemicals can actually cause uh, some of the psychotic symptoms that they claim to see. Uh, in people with uh, schizophrenia, and not, not to mention they can cause what they call tardive dyskinesia. So it's a uh, it, it's a huge it's a huge problem, it, it, and it all stems uh, kind of going back and uh, putting everything into a circle. Uh, the reason why counseling and sort of sticking to these relational ideas is so important is because uh, the these methods are we know that. For the most part, we know that we can help people with counseling. The evidence does seem to suggest that. And we do know that we're not going to hurt a person uh, neurologically or poison them. And, and this is one of the main tenets of any kind of counseling or any kind of, psych- any kind of psychiatry that a person's doing is this idea of non-maleficence, um, this idea that we're not going to cause harm to our clients and patients. Ironically, of course, psychiatry, by handing these pills out you know, by the dozens, is really causing um, a lot of problems hurting a lot of people. So yeah, that's a, that's a little spiel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I agree. 
Yeah, it's, I was. It's uh, all was, about the profits for these these drug companies. It's ridiculous. Well, well yeah, because I, I was going to say that that seems to be. I mean, at least when you when you look at it, even even just the, from a cursory glance, the 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 something behind big pharma in general, not even you know just with not even with just the psychiatric drugs, just any drugs, you know, it's the 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 the, the supposed cure is often is often worse than the disease. I mean, you, you, <laughs> you see you see any commercial for any drug that they put out there, and they have that you know ridiculously long speeded up disclaimer at the end with all the possible you know. Uh, it may cause your soul patch fall off. Well, exactly. It's like you know, That's, like that, that would be a tragedy, <laughs> <laughs> right? But, uh, but but yeah, it's 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 scary, and it's uh, unfortunately, it's it it just comes back to that, I guess, quick fix thing where people think they can um, speed up the process and just throw money or pills or whatever at the problem and it'll go away <laughs> so right. let, me ask, let me ask you sterling um because sure. I, i've seen you uh, make posts on facebook when you talk about how mental illness does not exist in the way that most people think it exists like depression for example and then people have a really visceral response to that saying how dare you say my depression doesn't exist? by you saying it doesn't exist doesn't, doesn't say i'm not depressed right now and uh, and so what do you say to those people that that get angry for for saying such a statement like like that? right yeah it's uh, it's very difficult to level with them when they're automatically in that really high stressed out anxious and volatile state of mind but what i really try to tell them is that i'm not i'm not trying to be negative i'm not trying to um say that you don't suffer, right? I'm not trying to say that you don't have, uh, that you don't have problems, that your uh, relationships aren't difficult, that your environment is not a struggle. You know, life is not easy for any of us. This is a, this is a very strange experience that we all get to share together. And, um, it's tough at times. So, uh, in my, my belief is that your brain is not diseased. So I'm actually here offering, um, uh, uh, the, the positive notion that you can recover from, uh, your problems of living. You can recover from your, from your issues, right? So, uh, and what psychiatry is saying is, is sort of the opposite. It's sort of this idea that if you have a mental illness, uh, you're actually diseased and sick, and so uh, and it's a it's a pathologizing label that creates a self fulfilling prophecy that lends credence to the idea that people are going to try to uh, sort of live out these negative labels, right? They're going to they're going to confirm these labels in their behavior, right? So th that's kind of what I try to tell people. I try to. I've never looked at depression as like uh, pseudoscience. Like I've never thought of it. That's a confirmation bias, I guess. <laughs> well. I mean, it's just, uh, and this is another discussion. Uh, there's a whole semantic uh, sort of sort of trickery when it comes to Ooh, talking about, uh, okay. yeah, a me mental illness, and it's a semantic discussion that we definitely have to have because one of the uh, cornerstones of psychiatry here, and uh, Danilo, this will this goes into what you were saying as well a minute ago with how I try to help people out. When when people think that they have a uh, mental illness, they do think that their brain is diseased. But the problem here is. Uh, mental illness, the terms mental obviously comes from the word mind uh, and illness. Uh, obviously, it it refers to a pathology, uh, a physical pathology like a disease. So uh, but the, the semantic problem here is that a mind is a, an abstraction. A mind is like for, for us, it's an emergent process, right? It's a, or an epiphenomenon of brain functioning. And, and so what happens is that a, a mind cannot be diseased uh, pathologically in the same way that a body can be diseased, right? A mind can't get cancer. A mind can't get AIDS. A mind can't get an infection, right? So, I, I so like that's to, a, I like to compare it to consciousness, right? Consciousness can't get an infection, right? Right, yeah. It's a, yeah if, if you're comparing the mind to like consciousness, because uh, I consider the mind or the consciousness to be like essentially the operating system of the body, it's got very proprietary software. It's hard to hack. <laughs> right, right. That's a good way to look at it, Dave. Yeah, you can't. And and, this, and that's been a big problem. They use the psychiatry, uh, and I don't think again, it's not conspiratorializing or think that they're doing it on purpose. But it's kind of just how this the situation has evolved from square one. But uh, when you tell people they have a mental illness, they don't even think about. And most people are confused. They don't. They don't they, they because they were told different things by different psychiatrists, by different people. And no one really has a bead on what exactly a mental illness is. Some people will say it's organic in nature, that it's mm -hmm. the brain causes it. Others will say uh, uh, 
well, of course, I, I'm, this is what I'm saying, essentially, that the problems are environmental and nurtural. But uh, you see, the, the, the problem here is, though, is that most people have been misled by psychiatry to think that it's an actual brain problem. But obviously, mental illness is a, is a, a sort of a chicken shit word used to sort of evade <laughs> what the actual issue is because a mind obviously can't be diseased. But then when you start talking about the brain being diseased, uh, then when that happens, you can ask for evidence. Well, where's your actual evidence that the brain is diseased, that depression is actual disease? And of course, this, you know, to digress, it goes back to the chemical imbalance issue. There not being any evidence there. So it's, uh, it's a way for people to sort of uh, dance around the problem without actually addressing it. And then it makes people believe that, of course, that they're really sick and causes all kinds of uh, problems. Uh, it, it also exacerbates entitlement mentalities and those kinds of things when people. So you think uh, psychology is just like a wing of like snake oil salesmen? Like that's they're essentially doing the same thing. Uh, psych psychiatry for them uh, for a good portion of it, but th that's and a lot of that comes from a lot of these. And this happened back in the 60s and 70s when uh, psychiatry was under fire. Uh, psychiatrists really want to don uh, the white coat, as Robert uh, Whitaker calls it. They really want to see themselves as medical professionals. And it's embarrassing to have your, your, your field shamed like that for not being an actual science. So uh, these guys have started, these uh, psych psychiatrists have started to sort of crusade uh, for their for their field and to make it look as relevant as possible over the years and to make it look like they're actual doctors, which was also the reason why the DSM three was sort of put into place in the in the eighties. And you can see Robert Whit Whitaker and some of these other guys talk about it. And I want to put this plug in now before I forget, um, so people don't know that I'm just pulling all this information out of my ass because that does happen a lot <laughs> of times with these kind of issues. So there's a few <laughs> books, uh, really good books on this topic. Um, Thomas Saws has written two. They're dated. I recommend reading those first to get a handle on the semantic problems. But the myth of mental illness, he deals with those issues. Uh, uh, Psychiatry, the Science of Lies is also a really good book. R look into that. Uh, and more recently on some of these other problems with psychiatry and diag the diagnostic issues and the, sort of the biology, uh, Elliot Valenstein, Ph.D., is a psychological researcher, and he wrote a book called Blaming the Brain. And he goes into the, the de very, very good uh, pinpoint detail as to why these problems can't be illnesses or diseases. So it's blaming the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Whitaker, of course, he's the scientific uh, psychiatric journalist, and he's written a book called uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic. It covers kind of the same stuff that uh, Valenstein's book does. It's really good. Uh, and also one that I've uh, started reading recently, it's it's pretty long, uh, but it's really good. It's on schizophrenia specifically, and it's by uh, Paris William, and he's a psychologist, Paris Williams. And the book is called uh, Rethinking Madness. So that's um, that's going to be a really good one to read. And uh, there's some more uh, kind of peripheral. Anything by Foucault is pretty pretty decent, although he was a hardcore statist. So I don't, and mm -hmm. it's a little a little dated, but that's yeah. just some some of the material. Yeah, recently, uh, I think Stefan Molyneux interviewed Robert Whitaker, right? I just finished his uh, interview on that, the an anatomy of an epidemic. So that's pretty fascinating. But what, what also, what I want to talk to you about, maybe uh, this might be a, a bigger topic, but um, you know, I'm an acupuncturist and a Chinese herbalist. You know, that's what I went to to college for. And so, you know, um, I have I have a bunch of books. Uh, you know, like like uh, you know, acupuncture and Chinese, especially Chinese herbs, because that's more considered internal medicine. You know, mm -hmm. there's a book just on like. You know, kidney problems. There's a book just on gynecology problems. There's a like it's, it's like really complex stuff. And then there's another book that I have, which is just on psychological problems. <laughs> and I got that because I was fascinated by it and I was reading through it. And uh, and it's very interesting because people ask me like, I have depression. What should I take? Right. And I guess that's the mindset that um, uh, a psychiatrist would have, like, you have depression, this is what you take. You have schizophrenia, this is what you take. It's like, w you know, one to one. Whereas if somebody comes to me as a Chinese herbalist and says, I have depression, there is no one herb or herbal formula for that. It, it's, it depends, like, how are, how are you sleeping? How's your energy level, right? How's, how's your emotional state? You know, how's, how are you eating? How's your digestion? How's your bowel movement? All this stuff go, takes into account. And that that is what uh, we treat. Like, so basically we don't really treat the depression. We don't treat, we don't treat, you know, I don't know, bipolar. We don't treat that specifically. We treat everything else because those are the constellation of signs and symptoms that are associated with that. 
which is kind of interesting, you know? So, um, so now, yeah, you just got me thinking about, you know, when you were talking about this, like, so, so yeah, we don't really treat depression. We treat everything else that, that, you know, you can physically see, like the patient tells you like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a poor appetite, you know, I'm, I'm fatigued and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, so I add that in there. Maybe, maybe that could, you know, talk about that further, maybe in a later discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But, but yeah. Inter- interesting. Yeah. Thought I, had that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I ever shared that with you on the page or not. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, th- this is uh, something I'd, I I think is pertinent to this discussion or germane to the discussion. Uh, so the question, and Danilo sort of hinted on it, what is the, um, so what is the fix, you know, to issues of everyday problems, depression, uh, and, and those kinds of, kinds of issues. Uh, and one of the main problems that I, that I see and that I think really help uh, people get a grasp on this because I move into another area of, of pharmacology, uh, namely psychedelic compounds, uh, uh, plant teachers, and those types of remedies, which uh, sadly are not talked about as much in relation to the subject, but I have to uh, help to dis- <laughs> right. I have to help disabuse uh, a couple of notions. Uh, and this is what I call people's drug schizophrenia. Right. So mm-hmm. I think that if there are compounds that we can use, uh, namely uh, more natural, less synthetic compounds that can actually help people uh, remedy any kind of uh, issues they have. But here, here's the and here's what I mean by drug schizophrenia. People think that the psychiatric compounds are what they can use to heal them. They're legal. The psychiatrists wear the white coat, hand them out. So they're they're good in people's eyes, right? But so all these other compounds that are illegal, these natural chemicals, uh, you know, we have cannabis, uh, psilocybin, you know, based on magic mushrooms, uh, L- LSE. Um, uh, here's the di- ayahuasca. Right, right, ayahuasca. Go, ayahuasca. Goes on Ibogaine, Ibe- 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 right? We can keep, Ibe- we can, yes. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah we, can na- we can name them for days. But uh, here, here, so here's the major difference. Uh, between these compounds and the psychiatric compounds. These compounds cause an intense uh, anomalous uh, experience, perceptive experience, uh, or an an intense, just what we call psychoactive experience that alters a person's uh, subjective experience and allows them to look at their own uh, life more objectively and to solve their own problems, right? It it, uh, facilitates deep introspection most of these compounds we can talk mm-hmm. about individual ones here in a moment and the remedies that uh, the quote-unquote remedy the, the bits of snake oil that psychiatry is recommending don't do anything uh, near that they're they're usually slow release uh, long-term compounds that slightly manipulate uh, say uh, uh, serotonin reuptake in the ssris with depression uh, and so so they're just slowly manipulating uh sort of these uh these these uh, neurotrans transmission areas in the brain or these uh, different brain regions but these other compounds uh, immediately cause a psychedelic experience that allows people to introspect and think about their issues uh, and these other compounds do, do not don't offer that and and so what and what we're really trying to get at is a person they want to really look at their lives they want to be able to connect with other people right the emotional elements of it psychiatric compounds don't do that uh, mm-hmm. illegal plant teachers uh, they've been called entheogens uh, hallucinogens, etc. These compounds actually do do what we want them to do, uh, as far and especially if you do them uh, with people, and even MDMA um, ecstasy mm-hmm. uh, yes. to an to to an extent will uh, facilitate that process, dissolve boundaries, and allow a person to uh, uh, actually look at themselves with more objectivity. It, it's not this uh, this piddly shit that can possibly cause more problems and uh, cool. other and exacerbate anxieties and depressions over the long term. So that's a uh, want to make clear and disabuse people of their drug schizophrenia. Is what what I refer to as. Yeah, um, I I, well, I think that's very important, and, and it's I mean it's it seems to be it seems to be trending in the in the direction that more and more people are becoming aware of that now um thankfully i mean i mean mdma you were just mentioning i mean that one i think is is that's being used for ptsd i think right that's one of the um uh one, one of the things that's being used for currently um but all of them unfortunately like you said i mean they're they're i mean dave dave, dave kind of joked about it but it's true they're considered taboo because they're quote unquote illegal um and because of their illegal status especially here in the in the states um you know research hasn't been quote you know allowed to be done on them so nobody knows although you know you look back in history and plenty of these things were used for you know 
hundreds of years <laughs> to treat, you know, a myriad of different things. Um, you know, and I'm somebody, you know, as far as like the psychoact, the psychoactive drugs, you know, I'm somebody I can speak from experience having done these. I, I mean, granted, it was in a recreational manner back then, but what you were, how you were describing the difference between, you know, what they do and what the, uh, the uh, legal drugs do um, to me, it really just seems like the difference between the legal drugs are essentially shutting down parts of your brain or trying to encapsulate or just you know, stop. Band-aid it. Ver yeah. Yeah, yeah. Versus versus the psychedelics, which are actually opening your mind and giving you the opportunity, like you said, to, to have it to to get really deep introspect. Because even, you know, you, you can really have deep introspective moments, like even back in my days when I was doing it recreationally, like I had some of my most profound thinking sessions, you know, just because you're you, 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 you like you said, the boundaries disappear. And um, like with MDMA, I know, you know, there's like sometimes a lot of that stuff, physical boundaries can disappear and people feel just more relaxed with each other and, and you can be more, you know, I mean, the joke with ecstasy is always everybody gets all lovey-dovey and stuff like that because you do, there's just these boundaries. But the with the more psychoactive stuff, it's like the mental boundaries just disappear and you're able to just look at things how you would never, you, you can't possibly see a lot of these things with the naked eye or just your general perception of reality. It, it's impossible, you know, because there's just, there's so just like the, the, just the color scale that, you know, we can't see most of the color scale. There's so much more out there that we have no idea about. Ta and Terrence McKenna called psychedelics, a conscious consciousness expander. Expand. Uh, yeah, I, I fully, I mean, Terrence got a little right. nutty with some stuff, but I fully, I fully, I, I support that statement. 100%. I mean, the, the whole, I mean, the whole, I can kind of get on board with the whole stone deep theory, you know, <laughs> like it's like, it, well, it does. It has pl air of plausibility. Yeah. But you know, right. so like, like I said, it's, I, I, I'm with you. I think, I think that people definitely just need to be disabused of this notion. And it, it really, you know, because there's the possibilities are, are at this point, endless what, what, what people can, what, what actually can help people. Um, and, and, and in a more natural way. And that's oh, not just saying just because important. it's natural, it's good. But it's it's got to be a leg up automatically over the synthetic crap that you're, they're just pumping into people's systems. Right. Now, yeah, you, you uh, drew in a lot of good points there. You're right. A lot of these, uh, one of the first things you mentioned was a lot of the uh, psychiatric drugs uh, actually have a, a negative impact on our uh, psychological functioning. Uh, benzodiazepines, they often prescribe for anxiety or tranquilizers, essentially. So they're mm -hmm. going to put you out, stupefy you, zombify you, all yep, of those. Good, all those. Right, right. I did them, I did them all. <laughs> right. Yeah, you were on the cocktail. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, that's horrible, man. You had, no, you had Lith Lithium, Thorazine, um, uh, tril Trilophon, Trilophan, I think. That was another experimental one when I first took it. Um, yeah, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of those, unfortunately. <laughs> right, yeah, that's... So, uh, we got a yeah, question. How, how do you feel about uh, autism and as uh, Asperger's? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and say right off the bat, I'm not, um, my knowledge as far as autism is concerned is not super, super great. It's not an area that I specialize in. Uh, I, I, I do, I do feel like the, uh, the neurodevelopmental issues like autism specifically is called a neurodevelopmental, uh, disorder, quote unquote. Uh, I think, uh, these things are, uh, more in line with uh, a neurodiversity, right? So people who have, um, especially children, of course, with autism have different, uh, viewpoints in regards to their socialization and toward dealing with people in society. And, and so there's an element of difference there. And um, actually, my, uh, my little nephew, he, he was diagnosed autistic. And, uh, you know, I always tell my cousin, and we talk about these issues, that uh, that, that um, is more like a gift to me. Autism is more like a, uh, like a gift. And so one thing with autism, though, I won't immediately say, like I did with the uh, classical mental illnesses, that it is uh, de facto uh, not an illness because autism does seem to have some psychomotor uh, issues that come along with it, some yep. some uh, some abdominal issues, uh, that is uh, very obviously an issue. So you know, I, I hate uh, putting the cart before the horse, which is what psychiatry does, and um, and, and uh, the, you know, the burden of proof is, of course, is on the people making the claim. But yep. I think there's clear observational evidence from uh, just the physiological and psychomotor issues with autism that it could be an actual quote unquote 
um, real uh, issue. Uh, but I, I, you know, Have I you say heard that the conspiracy theory that autism is caused by Monsanto fertilizers and foods, you know, pregnant mothers eat these foods and then it affects the baby's mind. Yes, I've and I've heard I've heard the vaccine. I've heard that one. It, no issues. Yeah, I've um, heard vaccine. Well, the, I've, the, heard, the, I've heard multiple. The vaccine one. I think the, the vaccine one. Most I think most people have heard, but right. I don't know. And I and mean, I feel pretty confident that they that they have actually debunked the vaccine one in at clinical trials and case studies. So, but but again, um, I you know I don't want to draw too much on the the autism mm-hmm. issue. I, I'm not. I don't feel okay. It was confident. just somebody who was asking questions right. in chat. Right. No, no. I, yeah, I, I see it down there. Now. I'm looking at it. And that that's the extent of my knowledge. I'm not an autism um, expert, but, you know, the things like autism, the neurodevelopmental and the neurodegenerative things like Alzheimer's to me is a clear disease. There's, you know, uh, likely plaques in the brain cause it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me interject real quick, because I sure. actually treated a, a 16 year old boy who uh, who had um, Tourette syndrome and Asperger syndrome. And he was. Um, yeah, he was pretty heavily medicated, and uh, I, I it was interesting. It was actually I didn't treat him with acupuncture; I treated him just with herbs. And this was all long distance. I never met the kid. <laughs> actually, no, sorry, I met him once, but everything was long distance over the phone call. You know, doing follow ups, and it was fascinating, fascinating case. My most fascinating case. I took like so much note, copious amount of notes, and um, all handwritten, of course. But um, it was a really interesting case because the the mother was very skeptical of Chinese herbs, but she still let me try and she still gave it to him, right? And he and they have like difficulty with textures like food. And he also had like his his body right. was um, you know, temperature imbalance. So like as a child, he didn't feel cold. So he would go outside naked in the snow and like not cry or anything, just completely fine. Like it was amazing. Like this kid and 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 he had these different ticks and they would transform different, you know, spitting or just hitting people, you know, he couldn't control it. And have he would go seen, to- uh, the- no, no, just say, and, he, and he would go to school and, and, and he would hold it in in school. And then the mother said when he would come back from school, he would release all these ticks. And it would be like machine gun fire. That's the way she describes it. One after the other after the other. <laughs> it's really amazing. And, and I treated him with herbs for months. And the whole time, you know, he was getting better. And she was like, nah, you know, it's the weather. You know, he's, he's eating better, you know. So she never, she never uh, credited the art, the herbs that I was giving in. And then she's like, you know, let's stop for a while. So we stopped for like, I don't know, a few months, I guess. And then she's like, I don't know why, but these ticks have been coming back. And so, and so she wanted me to give it to him again. And so right when he took it, drastic decline. And she was like, Oh my God. <laughs> and I thought that was an amazing right. case. <laughs> and, and, uh, and the kid, it, you know, it was very difficult to give it to him because you can imagine he has a difficulty with eating, you know, certain types of textures of food and taking Chinese herbs was difficult. So I had to give them in powders and, and, and capsules, you know, that was even difficult, but I thought that was a really, really amazing case. I never treated anybody with Reds and Asperger since then. That was my only case, but uh, yeah, I thought I would share that. Oh, that. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Cool. Yeah. It's a really fascinating yeah. case. That is, that's amazing. <laughs> right. cool. yeah. well, I'd, 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 I'd like to be, uh, you know, to be scientific about it, I like to see you replicate that with somebody else. But, <laughs> hey, um, hey, I, I tried to, I, I tried to be as, uh, how you say, well, as, no, no, I'm as not, possible. I, I kept I'm asking, not, like, are you sure? Are you sure? You know? Well, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not discounting the fact that it, that it, that it may have actually helped because you know, I, I, I would think from you know, in that regard, it would be like a kind of an individual thing. I mean, that right, may right. not, that may not have worked on somebody else who possibly is considered maybe further along the spectrum or not as far down the, you know and, and um and, i think there's a lot of variables there but again i'm not saying it, it, it didn't have an impact i i'm actually i'm serious i would like this i i, yeah. I hope you have the opportunity to that's actually interesting um because we were talking about this uh, earlier today um on, in, in a different forum um but the whole idea like i i have a little bit of knowledge about this because my um my, my, my baby mama um, has, uh, <laughs> that's what she did for uh, you know that's what she did for a long time um, before we met uh, you know after we, you know after we were together and then uh, she's now actually just gone back to it um, but you know there's there's a lot of talk just in, in in the people that you know do specialize in that area that you know it's it's something that there is definitely something wrong but it's a matter of there's just like different triggers that anything, you know, certain things could just set it off at any time. And that's why, so that's why certain kids have it from, you know, essentially from birth and other ones, it shows up later, which unfortunately ends up getting tied to, you know, automatically being tied to like things like vaccines and stuff like that, which again, it's not 
can I, I don't think it's 100% conclusive that it's you know that it has no impact because it could very well be a trigger in certain kids but in other cases it may just be a horrible coincidence but it happens later because there's just these different triggers so it's it's I, I mean I would say again I, I don't have the the um, you know experience or knowledge that you have in psychiatry or anything else in general um, and I just have the little bit of knowledge I've, I've gleaned off of her over the years but I, I would I would agree with mm-hmm. your your you know layman's assessment that it there's there's definitely a chance that there is something to this versus some of the other psychiatric stuff that's just kind of been thrown at people for years right well i mean it's just such a it's such a clusterfuck because it, it, it's there's a uh, i can see uh part of it where these guys are really trying to be uh legitimate and you know a lot of the psychiatrists really do want to help people who sure. are suffering so that i mean that's that's a definitely given but by the same token uh the the dsm obviously has been tainted has been tainted in the past, right? When you've had things like homosexuality in there, when you have these very questionable, uh, like compulsive type of disorders and things like that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ADD, ADHD, uh, and, and essentially uh, problems that look to me like uh, subjective valuations about uh, things that some people, behaviors that some people disagree with, maybe people in positions of power, uh, even mm-hmm. if it's in, at, on the school and the public education level with the, uh, the whole ADHD, ADHD phenomenon. So uh, it, it's really, uh, it, it's, a, it's a clusterfuck trying to discern what might have some type of legitimate merit. And this is why a lot of people are confused too. So trying to discern what might have legitimate merit as a, as a potential uh, illness, quote unquote, versus what is just, Something that somebody doesn't like, because here's the thing with the DSM, uh, and, and this is uh, a fact Thomas Oz pointed out, is that uh, these illnesses aren't discovered, right? They're not discovered like cancer, or HIV, infections, etc. Uh, they are voted on by psychiatrists in the ivory tower. They decide what the criteria yeah. mm-hmm. is, what the, yeah. uh, the, <laughs> the diagnostic settings are. And then, of course, uh, most mental illnesses you can't find on autopsy, right? Like you can find uh, <coughs> cancer on autopsy, infections, and a, a multitude of uh, medical illnesses on the autopsy table in a corpse or cadaver. Uh, that is not the same. Uh, it's not the same with uh, mental illnesses, obviously. I can't find depression. Uh, if D- Danilo had died, I can't find his depression on his corpse. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> let's just well, let's, well, just, let's just cut that. Let's just cut that little that, section out. That, that depends <laughs> if I was still if I was still married when I died. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sterling, you have a, a question. I, mean, I know in who chat. I'm sending. To, I know who I'm sending to this one too first. <laughs> uh, you have a question in chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. Uh, what if any preconceived expectations does Sterling have? regarding what his research will reveal when anarchistic principles are applied to talk therapy. Yeah. So I can talk a little bit about this. Uh, what I'm, what I'm, we're, we're getting close to that hour. I'm just letting you know. All right. Okay, sure. Well, just, just briefly then what I'm, uh, going to attempt to do with this is, is, uh, you know, work off the shoulders of giants, so to speak. Uh, most, uh, psychological theories are built, uh, off of theories that are pre-existing. Right. So uh, there's already one psychological theory that I believe uh, uh, has more of our principles and more of our ideas closer to heart. And I'm really glad you asked this individual asked this question because I wanted to talk about this. Uh, So my theoretical orientation in counseling is uh, choice theory and uh, choice theory was developed by one uh, William Glasser, uh, Ph.D. uh, back in the 60s. That's when it started, started out as um, uh, control theory, I believe, and it, it's advanced to choice theory and reality therapy. So his idea is real simple: that we're all uh, self-responsible human beings, and we are genetically encoded to meet basic needs. However, we can choose uh, to meet our our basic needs uh, volitionally, right? And uh, what we generally do as humans psychologically, we create what he called these quality world uh, images in our mind. And this quality world image is the way that we see our that we want our world to be and so we go about trying to meet our needs and meet these quality world images through our choices through our actionable behavior and uh one of the really cool things about choice theory psychology is that uh, glasser had this idea that people are constantly trying to control each other this is obvious and he called it um external control psychology and it's the idea that we're tra- constantly trying to uh, subtly coerce uh, each other be petty tyrants make people conform to our uh, worldviews and, and so we can meet this quality world picture and so uh, I, I foresee uh, choice theory psychology 
uh, mixed with existential psychology and my studies of neuroscience, uh, especially uh, uh, recent neuroscience studies and how it's going to uh, play into the field of counseling with ideas like uh, neuroplasticity or changing brains. Uh, neurogenesis uh, is the creation of new neurons and how uh, those activities uh, work out in the counseling environment. So that, that's, uh, I hope that kind of answers the question. I'm trying to synthesize these different ideas in order to create essentially what I'm calling neuro liberty therapy uh, as the uh, platform for anarchist counseling. Does that hmm. clarify yeah. it? It seems very interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, I, I can't, I can't wait to hear about you hear more about it once you get a little more concrete, you know, uh, a, a system and test and all that in place. Right. I've got a um, so I've I've just the only counseling really that I've got to do is with um, uh, you know for training purposes and things like that. So until I actually probably a year and a half, I'll have my. Uh, Unfortunately, my uh, do do the counseling and I can actually uh, start, uh, you know, practicing it in the way that I believe I should uh, practice as long as I'm adhering to their uh, ethical mandates. But but of course, I have the uh, I have the out with the whole feminist argument. I can I can use uh, these ideas if they can use their uh, social justice warrioring in, inside the counseling mm. <laughs> office. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, I really like it. And Choice Theory is awesome. I, I recommend anybody read his book. You guys would be really, you'd be like, that guy's talking about anarchism. But, you know, the thing about Glasser, he just didn't realize that when he was doing, uh, when he was writing his work, he was, uh, you know, he was pandering to government uh, and didn't even uh, realize it while talking about the problems with external control psychology. He didn't really <laughs> realize that government is a force of external control psychology on all of us, right? But, yeah. I, you know, I can, I can sort of... Um, uh, I can say that it's okay, I guess, because he did put a good, a good theory out there. It, so it's, it's, uh, it has good roots for me to work with and there's good constructs and stuff. So I'll be able to build off of it. And, and I'm grateful for that. And all the, uh, uh and, and the, the theory hasn't really been worked with by a lot of people. Not a lot of counselors like it because it's considered, um, a sort of, uh, you know, a lot of counselors uh, are moving more toward these, uh, construct constructionist, and uh, postmodern ideas of counseling where it's uh, based on like storytelling and the client sort of, a, you know, they, they tell their story and uh, the counselor uh, is basically this uh, really objective observer and plays with their uh, stories. It's a it's a real um, phenomenological way of looking at counseling is the way to put it, I guess, uh, experiential. But uh, and that's my, my uh, girlfriend's know. actually in college for counseling right now. That's <laughs> Thanks. what awesome. is she uh so, so what is she i know we're, we're limited on time what is she, what's her theoretical orientation or is she just doing so she's doing counseling so she must be doing her master's degree right okay right cool awesome uh, this has been this has been fascinating <laughs> i'm yeah. so glad we finally got we, so glad we finally got you on here i mean i've been i've been a big fan of your work just in general just your writings you know since i came across you a couple of years ago um, you know, we've chatted every once in a while, but, uh, I, this was, this was really cool. Uh, I think this was a fascinating topic. I mean, obviously, like I said, I, I have my own personal, um, ideas about this cause I, I've been on, on the inside of part of it, um, throughout my life. Right. But, uh, I like, I, I echo what Dave said. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to following you and, uh, and your work on this. Um, because the, the one thing, one thing you said er, very early on in the conversation, which really, which really stuck with me was the whole idea of like the cognitive dissonance thing. Um, just stick it, you know, that it just kind of blocks people and it's the same, it's the same thing here. So it's, um, you know, I, I think, I think the fact that people like, you know, quote unquote us, <laughs> you know, more logical thinkers, people have gotten over that hump already have an advantage in that, in, in that regard. And it could definitely be, I, I, I can't see why it wouldn't be helpful to be able to use that towards, um, you know, get it get it getting getting other people further along and possibly helping them versus just pumping them full of pills and stuff so it's uh, very exciting stuff man this is uh this has been great thank you very Absolutely. much for yeah. hey i appreciate you guys for having me very uh fun conversation i really enjoyed speaking with you guys so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. before we go please uh plug your 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 site and let people know where they can find you to follow your work Sure. So uh, just come to uh, Psychologic Anarchist, the Facebook page. You can just type in Psychologic Anarchist. And uh, my blog and web page is uh, psychologic-anarchist.com. And you can also find me uh, 
I work with the guys at the art of not being governed. I have for a long time uh, before the psychological anarchist. So check us out at the art of not being governed and not being governed, uh, dot com. So cool. Very cool. Thank I you uh, really, that. really appreciate you coming on Sterling. Uh, I've enjoyed just sitting back and listening to you explain this thing in detail. And uh, it was really interesting. And, and I think, I hope a lot of people really uh, consider at least the, the cognitive dissonance that they're probably experiencing hearing that depression is a, uh, you know, <laughs> basically pseudoscience. <laughs> right. And I'd be happy to speak with anybody about it. Well, you guys, uh, they can hit you up at, at Sterling Lusion on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> indeed yeah. Sterling Lujan on Facebook there you go excellent well magnificent conversation thank you very much gentlemen thank you Sterling um, so if anybody wants to help us out please uh, do so uh, we accept Bitcoin and Patreon patreon.com slash uh, Seeds of Liberty to help us out. We love doing this. We love having wonderful guests like Sterling here and we want to do more and um, we all know that comes with a cost. Nothing is free, right? No free lunch. So <laughs> you want to help us out, give value for value if you like our content, um, support us and uh, make a little donation. Um, it's the only doc- democracy I support, right? Voting with your dollars. So uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Wonderful conversation. So this is uh, The Seeds of Liberty. Um, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Peace.